Hello, my name is Ryan King and I'm the editor of the Fine Dining Lovers magazine, an online food magazine sponsored by San Pellegrino and Aquapan. We are honoured to be partnered with Fiden for this wonderful talk to celebrate the release of today's special. Eleven years ago, Fiden released a book called Coco, in which they asked ten of the world's best chefs at the time, huge names like Ferran Adria, Alan Cass and Alice Waters, to each provide 10 contemporary chefs they saw emerging across the world of gastronomy. The book was a great success and the chefs they pick became a Nostradamus list, or I should say Gastrodamus list, that predicted the rise of some of the biggest names of the last decade. People like David Chang, Mauro Calagreco, Claire Smith and Alex Attila were all featured. This spring, Fidem revisited the concept of Coco, assembling an all-star roster of the world's leading chef curators, 10 men and 10 women, to each select five emerging chefs from around the world. In celebration of the release of this book, we are joined today by three of the contributing chefs to today's special. Joining us from New York is Flynn McGarry. Hi, I'm Flynn. Nice to meet you. Flynn wowed diners and chefs around the world when he opened his first pop-up at a very young age from his family home. He's been on the cover of numerous glossy magazines, including the New York Times, and his pop-up series in New York, Eureka and Gem received critical acclaim. Flynn, how did you feel when you first heard your name on this list of emerging chefs? Once I saw all the other people in the book, um, it's such a great group of restaurants that inspire me too, that it was very sort of um, a great feeling to be included amongst these chefs that are emerging, but that I've kind of looked up to for so long. Nice. And we're going to find out a little bit from Hugh in, in, in a little while about how he picked some of the chefs that he, he suggested for the book. Just jumping now to, to May Lynn from Los Angeles. May started cooking early at her family restaurant in Michigan, where she emigrated at a very young age of just three months old from China. The family restaurant is actually still going today and may progress her own culinary knowledge training with the likes of Marcus Samuelson and Wolfgang Puck. Her cuisine is a boundary breaking mix of cultures, techniques and big flavours that hit heavy on the umami side and form part of a question she poses with many plates. What does American cuisine actually taste like? Hi, May. Hi, how are you? Very good, thank you. Can you tell us about your reaction when you first heard you would be featured in today's special alongside 99 of our emerging chefs? Um, well, it was a tremendous honor for me. Uh, I've read the original Coco cover to cover, and there were so many um, inspiring chefs. So for me to be listed on today's special is something that I really don't take lightly. Um, so many of my friends and peers are on this list, and just to be named alongside them is so exciting, um, especially to be named by an industry luminary like Hugh Atchison. It's uh, truly overwhelming. Hugh, I feel like you don't really need an introduction here now. Flynn and May have kind of set you up quite nicely. But our yeah, final that, guest today I'm good. is Hugh Atchison from Athens, Georgia. Hi, Hugh. Hello. How are you? So Hugh is the chef and owner of a number of renowned restaurants, including Five and Ten, Empire State South, and By George in Athens, Georgia. In 2002, he was Food and Wine Magazine's Best New Chef, and also the James Beard Foundation awarded him Best Chef in the Southeast in 2012. Back in 2009, Hugh was featured as an emerging chef in the original Coco book, and he has now been invited back to suggest his own list of five emerging chefs for this book. He recommended both Mei Lin, Flynn McGarry, and also Alex Chen, Matt Harper, and Ryan Smith. Hi, Hugh. Thanks for joining us today. Without embarrassing our emerging chefs too much, can you tell us a little bit about why you picked both Flynn and Mei? You only had five choices. Uh, I think being a chef these days is so much more than just food. Um, it's, it's thinking about food, but it's also being a contemporary leader. Um, and it's also about breaking boundaries and getting out of the old school chefdom in a lot of ways. I, I particularly like Flynn's ambition in doing it because it's so tied to design. Uh, his food is, uh, always seems so interesting in its use of vegetables. And I think that's sort of shape-shifting and really contemporary in that way. 
Uh, I also like Flynn's um, sort of take on Shefton because I think a lot was put around his shoulders on what a lot of people preaching as to what his career would be like because Flynn started at a pretty young age. And I kind of like the notion that he's defeated all of that and it doesn't really matter. He's succeeded on his own, um, his own accord. Um, May is just, May I've seen cooking for years and years now, but I just think uh, there's just uh, the way you're, she's redefined sort of West coast cultural food and this definition of American food is so beautiful to me. Like in the book, there's agua chilies, but then there's curries and just this amazing, like what we saw in globalism and food back when in the, in the crappy time of the eighties with um, wasabi mashed potatoes and crap like that. It's just, we've gone so far beyond that. And the authenticity that Maya brings to the food is just it's it's there but it's authentic and it's meaningful and it's deep in knowledge and really poignant um and it tells a story and i think that that's what chefs should be doing these days is telling a story so whether it be a design aesthetic with flynn or a cultural heritage and and the background story about where somebody's from with my it's they're just very different but i think very excelling next generation chefs I don't think they're embarrassed, but I'm pretty sure they might be blushing. They, they, they were really, really nice words from you, Hugh, there. And let's jump back to 2010, because you were featured as an emerging chef in the original book that we mentioned there, Coco. How did that feel? Do you remember that call coming through and being told you would be featured as one of the emerging chefs? Yeah, I do remember that call. I mean, it, it was exciting to be included then. I think it's, a, it's an exciting next generation of this series of books now, um, it was just, it was very global back then, and it's, it's, it's exceptionally global in this, in this edition as well. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're successes, whatever you make it, these things, inclusion in these things is always uh, a point of pride, and it's, it's really nice. It doesn't demarcate my success points in life. That's how I feel when I go to bed, like I've done something. <laughs> Very nice. And just to let people who are watching at home know how this is going to work, we're going to have a chat now for around 45 minutes. We're going to ask questions to each other and back and forth. However, you can ask your own questions. And all you have to do is underneath the video screen, you'll see a web form where you can enter your name and your question. To submit, please enter all of the details in the respective boxes. And towards the end, we'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can. Okay, Flynn, I'd like to jump to you again one second. Out of the 100 emerging chefs featured in today's special, I do believe that you're still the youngest on this list. And, and I know that doesn't define your career at the moment, but unfortunately it does become a, a news hook that people jump onto. It's also an inspirational position to be in, I think, that other people looking at a list like this and, and saying, I could have a chance at, at, at making a list like that at, at such a young age. How did all this start for you, Flynn? Your career is fascinating to me and I think to everybody who looks at it. Tell us a little bit about how you got started as a chef. Um, I started cooking in restaurants, I guess, professionally when I was 12. Um, pretty definitely illegally. Um, and in, in Los Angeles. And it kind of started as just, a, a, just like a true kind of curiosity. I had kind of gotten interested in food at home and my parents weren't very good cooks and I sort of wanted to take on the reins. And, you know, I, I specifically remember at the time wanting to learn more from, you know, mentors or, or chefs or school. And I remember actively, you know, researching if I could apply to culinary school while I was still in middle school. Um, and when I realized that I couldn't, I was like, oh, cool, I'll just go work in a restaurant. Um, and, you know, it, it started very like, uh, they kind of let me do the little tasks and were like, you know, there's a child here that's funny. And I just was, you know, kind of unrelenting. I, I you know, would show up early every day and would just show up every single day that I could. and you know, kind of found myself in a lot of cases, which I think people 
will understand if you've worked in the kitchen, like, you know, it would be the middle of a busy service and they would just throw me onto like the grill and be like, figure it out. And like, I think that was sort of when I really just kind of was like, this is an environment that I really love being in. Um, but then kind of, you know, simultaneously, I, I really want, you know, I wanted to learn, but I also wanted to, you know, I would, I would go to work and I would do everything at work the way that the chefs that I was working for wanted me to do it. And then I'd go home and be like, oh, I wonder, you know, what it would be like if I took this technique and put it with this ingredient or if I tried this and this. And so I sort of wanted this outlet where I could still create on my own. Um, and so that's where these sort of dinners in my house started, um, which were really in their, you know, when they started, they were just me cooking for like my parents' friends. Um, and then they just kind of tumbleweeded into this, you know, 12 course thing for 25 people. Um, that even sounds ridiculous to say now. Um, but it really was, you know, I, I would do them once a month and it, and it was, a way that I kind of saw how I wanted to learn being a chef. You know, I, I wanted to obviously learn from these places that I respected, but I wanted to find a way where while I was still learning, I could start to form my own style. Um, mate, jump into you a little bit now. I'd like to also throw the same question to you about your career. I know you grew up in a family restaurant and, and also that I've read that your family didn't really encourage you to go into the same business as them. When did you decide to focus on, on, on a culinary career as a serious focus for your future? Um, well, I think for me, uh, growing up in a restaurant um, since I was a kid, um, you know, I was just, um, I guess, surrounded by all this um, Chinese American food, but all, also just, you know, having dinner at the table like when I was younger and just having all these little family style um, dishes in front of me um, just seeing that array of food always just um, I guess I was always just intrigued by all that um, all the different types of food on the on the table um, it wasn't until I um, went into a bookstore one day and really saw all the different cookbooks of the different styles of food um, the fine dining that I really wanted to immerse myself into it um, fully. Um, you know, I, I went to college for pre-nursing and, you know, I wasn't exactly happy with it and I felt just a little empty. And so, you know, I had conversations with friends and they were just kind of like, you know, you do love cooking. Why don't you just do it? Why don't you just enroll in culinary school and just do it? And so, um, you know, I thought about it, did it the very next day and um, never looked back. That was pretty much it. And the family restaurant is still going, I believe, yeah? Yeah, my parents are still working. Um, it's, I don't know, they just kind of can't let go. Um, they're emerging their 70s and so they're just kind of like, well, we don't really know what else to do. You know, we don't want to sit at home and and just do nothing. So, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're taking it day by day, which is, which is great. Um, especially during these times, it's, um, it's a little relieving for me for, you know, to have them just kind of, you know, sit and relax at home and, and kind of not doing it to not do anything. Um, so yeah. And do they ever sneakily like call you in for, you know, come and help us behind the line. We need some help. Do you ever, do you ever get called back in as reinforcement? <laughs> Uh, sometimes, but <laughs> they're just kind of like, just go do your own thing. <laughs> and what do they think now that you are a chef? I know that it wasn't something they encouraged, but how have they accepted it now for you? And, and what do they think of your food and your, your interpretation and take on, on their cuisine? Um, when the restaurant, when Nightshade opened, um, they actually had come and, and tried all the food. They were actually really impressed, which was which was great because I think cooking for my dad for one is is very um, 
it's a little it's a little bit um, daunting just because he he is a tough critic, and so um, having them approve is is honestly, um, it, it made me really happy. So, um, yeah. Thank you, mate. And we're going to go into detail about some of your dishes a little bit later on in the conversation, and, and more particularly the dishes that you have provided for this book. But now I just want to jump to yourself, Hugh, and. I don't really want to speak about how your career started. You're one of the chefs that, that, that picked the emerging chefs for this book. More interesting for me is now that you're an owner, a leader and a mentor, how that transition happened for you, how it was for you, and also how you approach training and mentoring emerging chefs of the future, Hugh. I mean, it's an important role and one I know you take quite seriously. Yeah, I, I think being a mentor is not something you... you choose i think it's just hopefully you you lead in a way that people understand and empathize with and want to learn from you know throughout my career of working in many restaurants when i was younger i worked in some terrible places and you learn what not to do and then i worked in some amazing places you learn what to do um but now in this day and age i think uh looking for chefs to be true leaders uh within their community and in their kitchens and it's more important than ever because just for retention of people and is that we have to be teachers and empathetic advisors and understanders and all these things. So I think that uh, when I had one restaurant, I was there 90 hours a week. When I have two, you're kind of at each one, like 40 frantically going back and forth. And when you have three, it, you suddenly have a, a little day pass to disappear because you've had to figure out manning them without you. Um, so, you know, I'm, I think that's when you can begin to, um, have the confidence to be a mentor and the time to be a mentor to people. But, you know, I, we all have people, sometimes I've got mentors in my world, some of which I never even worked with, but we just know each other so well that I can just ask them questions about the business and strategy and what they're thinking about food, like Frank's did in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, so mentorship is is a really interesting thing but more of it's uh it's i think it's just having a phone that people will call and you'll answer if they're looking for any sort of help at all you know the the book really showcases the the, the amazing diversity of food in the world i mean it's always been diverse but i i just think through the good aspects of globalism is we're just seeing it now we see it on plates more than ever before and that's just the increased transfer of information and people learning in different ways. But this is also, I think good chefs don't stop learning. Um, and never, I never want to position myself as an expert in anything. I want to be position myself as a learner. And I think that's what this book is showing is that, uh, that lack of expertise keeps us uh, really curious. And I think that's one of the most important attributes of being a chef. I think that's a really nice, nice line. And, and, and staying on the whole young chef idea, just for a second, um, Sam Pellegrino, who have partnered with Fiden for this event today, runs something called the Young Chef Academy, in which they offer tutorials for young chefs on all manner of topics, business, marketing, storytelling, team management. Um, at Fine Dining Lovers, we recently conducted a survey on this platform, speaking to about a thousand emerging young chefs and asking them what they wanted from their career, from, from their education, but also what they wanted to improve in terms of their own skill set. I think what's interesting, and you can see it on the screen right now, is that restaurant finance came out number one in terms of, of skill sets that people wanted to improve upon. Second was business and management. Uh, third was marketing and communication. And it wasn't to far from the list that we actually had anyone speaking about culinary skills or cooking skills. Um, and I just found this interesting and we wanted to bring it up and have a chat with you guys about it today. Flynn, jumping to you, were you surprised by those results when, when you saw them? No, I think that, um, I think that, you know, the way that uh, cooks are taught and trained and, and you know, that that's sort of what I even mentioned about, you know, why I wanted to do the pop-ups was like, to learn finances, to learn like these things before I was fully just thrown into the fire with a restaurant. And I think that there's this sort of like, you know, forever, 
as chefs, you know, you're teaching people to be really good cooks. And that means nothing once you become a chef. You know, it's it's such a tiny, tiny, tiny aspect of it that like I it's you look at the top things there and I'm like, those are all things that you learn in other forms of of the world. I have learned none of those things within a kitchen. There's no time also. Like I, and I think like that is the something that I, you know, struggle with even of like, you know, you I would love to start to teach cooks and people at restaurant finances. But, you know, I do the restaurant finances on Sundays while everyone has their like one day off essentially. And so I think that, you know, restaurant finances, business management, mar marketing, they all are really hard to to stay on top of and, and to put at this level, especially in cooks' minds, because, you know, what you're taught is just like, there's someone coming at 5 p.m., you need to make sure that the food is ready. It doesn't really matter how, like anything else, that's all that matters. And so I think that, you know, trying to, to like find this way to, to balance the jobs a little bit more where you're a little bit less one track minded, I think it, is, is important for that. And I think like, that's what I think a lot of cooks, even me talking to like cooks that have been coming back now that we're reopening, that they've kind of started to be more curious about within the, within the pandemic, because you know, there was, there was a year where they sort of had to deal with their own finances and think about, you know, loans and whatever. And, and I think that chefs are just such sort of, you're going at such an intense speed on a day-to-day -day basis um, that you forget that, you know, those aspects are so important to the business and so important to like the longevity of the business. And they're usually the ones that are most frequently overlooked. Um, so I, I think it makes complete sense that those are the things that, you know, I would love to learn more about restaurant finances as well. Yeah, we interviewed Farhan Adria just as the pandemic was hitting. We sort of reached out to him to see what, you know, what does he have to say on this, the sort of the godfather of creativity. And what was really interesting is he came back and was like, it's all about restaurant management, restaurant management, restaurant management. That's the skills people need. Hugh, do you think this is something we should teach at culinary school, these type of skills? Is it something we should have more focus on? Or is that something chefs should add to their bowl later on in life, like Flynn did with the pop-up and sort of learning as he went along, or, or even going for extra education, perhaps, on the side of a culinary course? Yeah, I mean, it should be included in, in culinary school a little bit more, uh, definitely. I mean, culinary school, the one big... And that's not bashing all culinary schools. There's some good ones, but people approach me and ask them, should they go to culinary school or should they do something else? I'm like, travel, just save the money and travel and learn on your own and read a lot and craft your own resume. And, uh, but just actually go and do, do services somewhere. Um, but culinary schools often put people in a position where they they think that they're really prepared as a chef, but, a lot of chefdom is, has nothing to do with cooking. It's your ability to do finances and payroll. It's the skill set of, you know, if you can replace a thermocoupler on a six burner Imperial hotel stove, you just save $600. <laughs> um, so it's, it's all balancing and, and figuring it out. But right now, unfortunately we put, we continue to do this, uh, yeah, you know, hamster wheel of churning people out through culinary school, who go into business and then quickly shut down their business because they have no idea. Um, they may understand food costs, but if you can't read a New York City lease um, or have access to a good lawyer who can, who's not going to charge you much, you're kind of in a precarious position right out of the gate. Um, and, you know, you can't just in this day and age throw labor at the scenario and because we can't afford a ton in this industry it's a pretty shaky small bottom line so i don't know i mean there somewhere along the lines people need to be well equipped to go into business and uh, at the end of the day as much as i always want to say the restaurant world and food is all about art and unfortunately it's about you know employing people and paying people and making enough to get by and not shutting your doors. That's more May, like jump into yourself 
Um, what's stopping chefs accessing this type of stuff later in career? Is it the fact that there's so much juggling, so much going on? I mean, why why couldn't you do this? A lot of people would do a, a, an MBA as a, for a business if they've done a business degree to add that masters onto their string of of, of of expertise. Should chefs be looking to do something like that, perhaps further learning? And if if so, why are they not doing that? Well, I, I really think that the standard answer is time. Uh, the restaurant environment is extremely demanding. Um, so to completely remove yourself from the kitchen is a luxury in its own. Um, so for like for many of my peers, um, we really can't afford that uh, to be outside of the kitchen, just kind of strictly doing that, especially if you're in a, a, a small restaurant, um, you know, but really nothing is really stopping us. Um, you just have to go about it resourcefully, um, ask questions, talk to other chefs and operators and, and see what they're doing. It's, it's really a function of time that you're really to take to learn more about it. And that's really kind of how I went about it. And it's served me pretty well so far. Good advice. Very good advice. And actually, you I, I have back? something on the, please the, go for it. The MBA thing. I, a year ago kind of was, you know, think was sort of wor working on this project idea that was a little bit bigger. And, and I was talk talking to this person that had come to the restaurant a lot who had a Stanford MBA, very smart, knows a lot about business. And I remember, you know, going through P and L's and spreadsheets and ideas and, and projected costs and all these things. And I think what I, I, I found really interesting was the, you like, you kind of need to understand, like, I almost refer to it as like pirate finances where it's like, it's not, you, you can't learn what is important to spend money on in the middle of a service when something's breaking from going to business school. And, you know, you can't learn, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go build, you know, fix this thing myself so I can spend money on this other thing for someone to do or, you know, it's, yeah, we spent a bunch of money on, on this tonight because, you know, uh, someone didn't show up. So everyone was going to have to wait sometimes. So we had to put another tape, like those sorts of on the moment decisions that you learn working like service in a kitchen, I think is where it's where, you know, I never wanted a, just a pure finance partner because I remember even sitting in, in, meetings with our investors and things about, well, why'd you spend money on this? And I just kind of been like, you weren't there. Like <laughs> it needed to be done. Otherwise the night would have blown up. And like, I think that that dynamic is, is what a chef is, is understand having to, to understand both the small picture of everything going on every single night and what each plate of food goes to a guest and the experience and how that affects your bottom line, how that affects your top line, how that affects you, you know your employees, your investors, your your community. That skill to be able to think so macro and kind of you know on both ends of the spectrum, I think, is almost impossible to be taught in a school setting, because you know you're never going to have to be like cool. You know it'd be like a question on a test of like you know so your your cook just walked out of service you know you need to hire someone but they they don't have paperwork so you have to pay them in cash so you have to pull from your your food cost budget for your farmer's market how are you going to file with the irs like that sort of question you can only understand if you do all of those things together yeah i, I flynn i think that's very uh that's all really smart and the way i put it is I, I I pretend at the, uh, an executive chef owner these days to me is like a head nurse in an ER. You're in charge of triaging every situation yeah. and every day is different. And I always put it as sometimes yeah. the dishwasher, the machine is broken. Sometimes the dishwasher, the human is dead. What, you know, yeah. how do we work through these things constantly changing? Restaurant is a different thing every bloody day of the week. It's completely different. Every customer is different. You know, all these things are just totally different. So what they do need to teach is triage. It's like, how yeah. do you how do you expedite life? Not just the food to table three. How do you expedite yeah. your life? 
meaning we get it from this place to this place in a really efficient manner. It makes sense to everyone. But yeah, the ability to think about 25 things at once is what Sheftum really is. And I don't, I think we ill prepare people for the stress of this occupation, but it's, it's stressful if you let it be stressful. If you feed off of that and find it really interesting, then as I always say, it's like, we put out fires with big smiles and it's just what yeah. we do. And then you've got to have that mentality or you're going to, this industry can be miserable to a lot of people. And I think that the key is, is to how to make it entertaining and smart and fun and challenging so it doesn't drive you crazy. Yeah, I mean, my cook literally really just texted nice. me, our freezer broke, question mark, while this is happening. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. And that's in the back of your head now. Something. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what you're, you're triaging right now. I know what I'm going to, I know what I'm going to go do after this. Yep. Yep. Staying on skills a little bit, but shifting, shifting away from, from chef skills. Hugh, you run a company called Seed Life Skills in which you teach families and, and regular consumers about all sorts of modern day skills, including culinary techniques. Can you tell us a little bit about this project. Why did you create it and, and what is the aim with that project? Yeah, it's not extraordinarily active right now. It's a, it's a curriculum that we put up online after um, our school superintendent in the public school system where I live, my daughter was in grade, I don't know, whatever, uh, six, and went off to home ec class and came back with, uh, she told me what she had made, which was like instant Pillsbury croissants wrapped in cheap bacon, it baked in the oven, and the red red velvet cupcakes with tons of red food dye in it. And I was like, wow, well, that's not very good. So I went and had a meeting with them, and uh, we, we devised this curriculum, and we started this uh, non, not not-for-profit uh, philanthropy, which aimed to raise some money and then develop this really concentrated uh, life skills curriculum that would replace that. So it did in our school jurisdiction, and it's been downloaded and used uh, around the world in like a thousand different school districts. So it's just basically like, how do we raise a better generation? Well, we teach them how to make a vinaigrette from scratch and roast carrots and butcher a chicken and suddenly you've got a better human just out of the not necessity of eating happy meals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But it's also giving kids in the most difficult times of their lives are like 18, 19, 20, unless you're Flynn, which was 11, 12, 13, um, <laughs> giving them the skill set to be able to go, I got this. I can at least feed myself and those around me and I've got some simple skill sets. And that's all cooking is. It's not rocket science. We're here to talk about a book that's full of amazing recipes. Today's special is packed full of menus from every one of the chefs featured was asked to provide their own menu. Um, and these can be made at home. And, and I think they all look absolutely amazing. So I'd like to sort of get into some details about some of these dishes. May, first of all, yourself, could you explain a little bit about the menu that you suggested for the book? Uh, it was a real mix of dishes. I saw a ceviche next to a curry. There was quite a lot of seafood running throughout lots of the dishes there. Talk to us about the recipes that you provided and why you provided them. Um, well, seafood is, is something that I just really love eating. Um, and exo sauces, um, you know, for instance, in the kanji, um, it's a dried seafood condiment that recontextualizes a dish that I grew up eating. Um, growing up, I, I ate it with like pork floss with some scallion, a little drizzle of soy sauce. But I think for me, the, the EXO sauce really adds a, a depth of umami that really creates a new dimension of flavor that's, that's really satisfying um, in a warm kanji. Um, it's one of the best the, sauces the... I've ever had, EXO. I mean, it's, is it as hard to make as it seems from the outside? Because when I look at it, I'm always like, that's a lot of steps that need to be done separately and then combined. How difficult is it, especially uh, to make yours? hard it's not necessarily hard it's very time consuming um the way i make my exo sauce is you know I, I i gather all of some of the best ingredients that you can find um i source a lot of my dry seafood from japan and so um for the dried scallops um you have to reconstitute it in warm water then you have to like hand shred it until you get like little thin threads of the scallop um, for the the dried shrimp, um, 
I'll I'll actually source the little baby dried shrimps, so I don't have to, um, I guess grind it into a powder because um, I like to see all my ingredients. Um, and I actually add a little bit of an, like baby anchovy into um, my exo as well. And uh, typically there's some sort of ham. Um, I actually use uh, prosciutto scraps um, that I get um, and kind of, you know, grind all those things together. And it's really just cooking it down and caramelizing everything slowly um, one after the other. Yeah, you're making me really hungry. It's one of my favorites. It really is one of my favorites. And you also did this shrimp toast with curry. Can you talk to us a little bit about mm -hmm. that dish, where it came from, why you came up with that? Um, well, shrimp toast is actually one of my, my favorite dim sum items um, growing up as a kid. And um, I got the, the curry idea from one of my favorite noodle joints in Hong Kong called Khao Ki. Um, they specialize in um, this curry brisket noodle. Um, it's it's with rice noodles, but I thought, you know, utilizing a curry and using, like, the bread in the shrimp toast and sopping up the curry, that, that's kind of how I conceptualized the dish. Yeah, no, I, the shrimp toast in Cantonese curry, just for me, just, just texturally and just the matching of the flavors and taking going away from a noodle dish but still including that curry in there. And just the textural match with that is just so, uh, so good. Um, that, that, uh, the bronzino dish is so pretty though as well with the salad, the full butterfly and then skin side down crisp and then the building, the perfect building of the salad on top uh, just was so refreshing and, and so sort of current and smart. And, but I just love the fact that your breadth of recipes went from agua chilies to the curry and, and just, and then the Bronzino, it just kind of uh, shows the the amazing diversity uh, of your food. Yeah, I love the fact that you took exo sauce that was already packed full of umami, famous for umami, and said, how can I get more umami? <laughs> Stick some anchovies underneath as well. How do I get even more delicious into that? <laughs> I have some amazing exo sauce in my fridge, and it's it's really good. Don't make me jealous, yeah. man. It's one of those you can put it on almost anything <laughs> and it just brings it to life. No, it's so delicious. Flynn, let's jump to your menu a little bit. I know you're still in the back of your mind. You're worried about that fridge that's got a problem. I know I know what's happening. You're triaging right now. Um, I know what's going on. But your menu seemed to be a little bit more vegetable heavy, your offering for the book. Really beautiful and, 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 and as Hugh said, beautifully artistic and, and so colourfully plated. Talk to us about some of the dishes that you put forward and why you put those forward. Yeah, I, I want to pull up the menu, actually. I um, really wanted to do, like, nothing that was, a, you know, the restaurant, I always say, is a, a vegetable restaurant that uses fish and meat for, like, seasoned vegetables. And I wanted to show dishes that I think kind of showcase that. And I think, like, the, the pea dish is a is a... One of my favorite examples of it's, you know, I wanted that perfect, you know, the most delicious, fresh, cold peas. If I just put raw peas and juice in a bowl, it would taste good. But, you know, my job is to find a way to make it taste a little bit better. And so, you know, we, the, the, it's raw peas and very, very lightly cooked peas and, this um, uh, kind of barely set cheese that almost has like a tofu texture. Um, and there's a fig leaf oil, which I, I love using with, with vegetables because it adds this real nice kind of toasty kind of nuttiness that without actually having to cook anything. Um, and the broth on that dish is um, where there's so many kind of layers that you won't ever see. You know, there's, there's reduced muscle stock, which gives it this like kind of salinity and like, you don't necessarily taste that there's muscles in it, but you taste that there's, you know, this sort of like kind of in, intensity that you would only get from using meat or fish. Um, but I wanted it to be bright. So we take the muscle stock and blend it with lemon verbena. Um, so it sort of adds this real like punch of, of herbs and, um, you know, even using like the thyme flowers are like probably the most intense thing on the dish. Um, and I, I, I think that's something that I really love to showcase of like, 
you know, using, I think that's a very California thing from me of like using these different herbs and, and, and citrus and things to really like add this sort of punch to a dish um, that sometimes is necessary. So going into spring, so perfect time for people to start focusing yeah. on this dish, mate. I mean, I, yeah, I think we probably in New York have like two months until we'll get peas, but uh, hopefully soon. Um, and what about your other dishes that you put forward? I know you put some, this one is beautiful and so colorful. Talk to us a little bit about this beet dish that you put forward. So, yeah, I, uh, I've been talking about beet for a solid seven years of my life. Um, and that's kind of why I find them kind of comical at this point, which is that they have gone through so many, uh, my relationship towards beets has gone through very many eras. You know, I, I, I grew up hating beets, kind of found them very, not hating them, I just found them very boring. Um, so it was always sort of my goal to make them interesting. And, you know, I spent so long sort of doing this idea of beets, trying to make them resemble meat. I, I you know, I, I, even in this one, we use this technique of smoking it and drying it and getting it to be chewy and all and caramelizing it and these sort of adding all these flavors. But this is kind of one of the first times that I, I wanted to, to see the beet as a vegetable um, and not, you know, try to disguise it really. And like, you know, still have it have that incredible layer of umami with, you know, using mushrooms and black garlic and soy sauce and kind of reducing all of it. But, you know, it being this like, kind of like fruit te dish is almost how this one feels like it, it it plays off of that sweetness with the black garlic and the beets and then you know it it's quite sweet but then with the with the mushrooms it, it kind of levels it out um i always try to move away from the sweetness and, and this was kind of the one time where i wanted to see how i think you know black garlic is a very savory but incredibly sweet ingredient and i wanted to see how that with treating beets the same way we're making them incredibly savory but really sweet um i, I love the menu and, it, and again it's it's a specific dish to have it on, on a specific menu I, I i totally agree with flynn that i'm not sure if i'd want to eat a big plateful of it at eight o'clock just by itself on tuesday um but it's really interesting to me that uh, it, there's a constancy in a lot of chefs to want to recreate meat. And I think the vegetables and mostly at presentations such as this are purely vegetable. They just keep getting equated to be meat-like in texture and consistency. And I think that's a mistake. I think that's a, that's a sort of relegating the idea of a vegetable to a very small parameter. To me, this is just earthy. Uh, and then the kinship between the matakis and the beets are just such big, deep baritone flavors that that sort of natural sugar aspect to it just all makes sense. Um, and I, I love beets, but you know, we see beets in four different ways at pretty much every restaurant across the planet. It's like balsamic, horseradish, goat cheese, basil leaf. You know, it's it's a very narrow scope. So I think this redefines it a lot. And I, I just love the idea of the Bordelais too, that we can push the idea of meatiness towards vegetables without making a be beet tenderloin or something stupid like that. Um, so, you know, I've always just wondered, like, with Beyond Meat and all the impossible stuff, like, why can't we just teach America how to cook fucking lentils? Why do we always have to cook, make it look like fake meat? It is a weird obsession we've got, isn't it? Just celebrate the veg. I, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've always thought of it as, like, you know, instead of going, oh, I want this vegetable to taste like meat. It's like, no, you just want it to taste good. Like, that, yeah. you know, if you actually yeah. think about what you mean by meat, it's like, it's fatty, it's satisfying, it's umami. You can just make a vegetable taste delicious and even eat some meat on the side. 
And but, I think actually, but the, that's the, the... that's a really interesting thing. Is that I, I'm of the generation. I'm old, older than you guys, right? I'm the mentor here. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what what I've seen in my in my time as a chef is chefs finally learning how to cook vegetables. And so a recipe like this shows that we're still pushing that idea. Because before, 25 years ago, lost in continental cuisine was vegetables were just like second thought. I mean, unless it was like a vichyssoise or spring asparagus, um, vegetables just weren't really focused on in the larger sphere. So this to me shows the possibility of food is still very much uh, out there to, to push and to change technique and, and to challenge our notions of what vegetables really are. I love the way Hugh described the deep, boomy, baritone flavors of the dish. I think that's a great way of, of, of describing the deepness and, and of, of a hit of food. And they, they all sound delicious, guys. And I, I can't wait to have an attempt at, at my end to make some of these recipes as well and, and, and see those flavors myself at my end. And, and finally, I'm going to try to do some exo sauce. It's one of those things I've always had in the back of my head. I should do that one day. Um, I even once got the dry scallops ready to do it and then just didn't. I wimped out of committing to all of that step and those processes you describe in the book. Um, people who are watching at home, if you're interested in this book, you want to get into some of these recipes, you want to try and make them yourself at home, just to remind you that this book can be ordered online now at fiden.com forward slash today's special. So that's fiden.com forward slash today's special. I believe now is around about the time that we open up to some questions from the audience. So if you're watching now and you haven't quite submitted one of your questions yet, feel free to do that in, in, in the form at the bottom of the screen. Just before we jump to these questions from the audience, I'd like to give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions of each other, actually. You know, is Flynn, starting with yourself, I know you, you perhaps had a question for Hugh before we, we began this conversation. Would you like to, to open it up? Yeah, um, I was wondering because it's it's a it's a thing that has been on my mind a lot recently. Of the the, you know, you talked a, bit, a little bit earlier about how when you have one restaurant, you're there ninety hours, and two, you split it, and then three, you get this pass. What the kind of process is like of pulling yourself out? You know, what I, I think that's something that a lot of chefs always wonder when you know and is something that I'm wondering of like, oh, is there ever an end to this? Like where you can, how you do that process and, 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 you know, or is it really just all a ruse and it never actually happens? I think it's all a ruse. Never really happens. Um, it, it's hard. Cool. I mean, you know, or you can pull yourself out and I've done this on multiple occasions where you're like, I mean, it, it's just like, you got to do what you need to do. You, you, Restaurants are weird. They're just so weird. Um, I've got a number of clients. I mean, my first restaurant's been there for 21 years. I mean, I've got a lot of clients who are like still pissed at me that I stopped working there every day of my life for like 120 hours. And, you know, and that that's not fair um, to us as chefs and as business people. We're going to grow our enterprises. You have to look behind you all the time and just make sure you're leaving an imprint of leadership behind you and raising people up and passing on the responsibility that, that makes them good people, that makes them succeed in their own ways. Um, I think the most greedy thing that chefs can do is um, want the fame and fortune of multiple restaurants without raising up the people who are really doing those restaurants when they're not there. And I think that's really important, but it's uh, it's hard, you know. Expansion is hard, and I've spent the pandemic mostly back at five and ten. But and this is not meant to sound egotistical, but the place is better for it. Like everybody there is like they're they're in a really good place right now, and I'm really proud of them. And they they turn it around that it's because I'm there more, and I turn it around that no, they could do this without me always here. So it's just a matter of, I don't know, uh, figuring it out and never leaving but not being there. Does that make sense? I don't. I don't know. It's hard. I mean, yeah. ask Jean Georges. I'm not Jean Georges. <laughs> Man has like 67 restaurants. I don't know how he does it. But He's I think that, even... no. I mean, that, 
that I think is the thing that, you know, it's like, I feel like there, there's always been this, like, it's, there's two ends of the extreme and it's like, you know, it's like, oh, you could have 60 restaurants and never be at any of them where you have three restaurants and you're constantly jumping between them or you have one restaurant and you're just there until you die. And I think like that is such a weird thing that, you know, we, no one, I, I've spoken to so many chefs about it and they're just like, yeah, it just, you know, it's a constant thing. You know, we, the other day was the first time that I like left service a tiny bit early because I was just exhausted. And then the next day the cook quit. That was like, you know, running the kitchen and to, to go move somewhere. And I was like, cool. Now I'm on the line every yeah. night again for the yeah. foreseeable future. And how I think, you know, it's that, it's that fragile of like, you know, this industry is always a stick that can just break and. Break you know, everything. I've, I've, I've always told myself with the, the rise of automation and things like this, that, well, that's never going to impact what we do. They'll always need chefs. Now with a lack of labor, I would happy take a robot cooking some food in oh, the back. 100%. I yeah. mean, I can't find anybody. Um, so no one can. if you've got a robotic friend, you let me know. Yeah. Be careful, guys, because it is coming. I saw some Samsung giant arm that does. Oh, I know. They've got a place in Silicon Valley that does bowls and stuff with the robots now. That, it's it's intriguing. I mean, but literally, uh, I mean, we're going to have to change a lot of our businesses in the next few years because we don't have people. Um, you know, fifteen dollar minimum wage doesn't cut it anywhere. I mean, it's like I I'm going to have to pay line cooks twenty two dollars now uh, just to attract them back to the industry. That's I don't know. It's 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 a really weird time in the industry. Would you like to throw a question out to, to me, Hugh? I know you had some stuff for her as well, and we seem to have been throwing lots of questions at you as 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 the mentor today. What would you like to throw a question out to me? May, what's uh what what is next for you? What do you want to do, and how is the restaurant coming out of the pandemic? Well, I just opened up a fried chicken restaurant. And um, that's actually been an eye opener for me um, because. Does that mean nightmare? Uh, doing, eye opener? Um, <laughs> um, maybe a little bit. Um, I've just never been through something like that before, and so it's 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 a new experience, and um, you know, really looking forward to to figuring it out. Um, you know, it's it's just like constant like every second i'm like busting out a hundred sandwiches in an hour which is a little bit intense that's literally more than one sandwich a minute so um just kind of learning and 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 seeing where it takes me um yeah that's yeah yeah it's it's a, it's a difficult time to open up anything and uh i think that it, yeah. that's the biggest thing is like i can open up, i've probably opened up like eight restaurants now and not all mine some other other people's and whatever you, you never know what to expect i mean I, it's just yeah. it's really it's different every time and sometimes it's extraordinarily stressful and you know but what we got to do is create good environments where people want to be every day and that, that's the key absolutely yeah. And May, what about yourself to Flynn? Do you want to throw a question out to Flynn before we move on and, and we'll start to answer some of these great questions we're getting in from the audience? Sure. Uh, Flynn, so you've had a, a pretty unique journey in the culinary world. Um, is there anything that you wish you would have known before you opened up Gem? How to fix uh... a freezer. <laughs> Honestly, no. I think that um, I, I really do believe that, like, you know, I, I, I look back at the restaurant thus far and I definitely spent a lot of the time figuring things out. Um, but those things that I really feel like I like did not know when we opened or like things that I like, you know, went into being like, yeah, I could figure that out and was a thousand times harder are things that you can only learn by doing them. And, you know, I think that that was always my thing with, with Jem was, you know, the opportunity sort of came to, to open the restaurant and I had to sort of go, you know, do I want to just go keep 
you know, learning and, and doing little things? Or do I actually want to commit to this thing and, and know that there's going to be a bunch of shit I don't know, be a bunch of stuff that I'm going to mess up. There's going to be, you know, a, a bunch of mistakes I make, a bunch of things that, you know, we're probably going to lose money. It's a first business that usually don't work out, but I just have to do it. And I think like that kind of realization of just like, you know, I, it could have gone so much worse. Like, I, and I think that just figuring out things, like, even as you say, like I, when you open a restaurant, it's like, I had no clue what it could have become now when I had thought of my, you know, restaurant I wanted to open five years ago. And mm -hmm. I think that that idea of like, oh, I, I keep needing to know more or I need to, to know more without just jumping into the fire, I think can put a lot of people in a position where they never quite commit to the thing that, you know, it's like the, you need to do something kind of dramatic to actually like, learn something sometimes and I and I definitely felt that with the restaurant where you know I could have kept doing what I was doing before and learning more and learning some things but uh, I don't think I would have quite absorbed the information like just you know jumping into the fire and opening a restaurant and then you know dealing with it through a pandemic and dealing with it through all of these things I think that you can only learn that by actually doing the thing with a lot to lose Now, we do have lots of questions from the audience, so I'd like to jump into as many as possible, starting with one from Chris Bird. We've heard so much about how the pandemic has affected chefs and restaurants financially. How has it impacted chefs and restaurants creatively? May, would you like to, to start with that one? How has the, the pandemic impacted chefs and restaurants creatively? Um. Honestly, I think uh, throughout pandemic and, and throughout quarantine, I really just um, emerged myself in, in a lot of books, uh, reading a lot of different recipes and um, just different uh, just different things out there um, and just kind of constantly testing out recipes and doing things like that, um, just constantly doing things so I don't get stagnant and, you know, just not doing anything. And I know you launched a new business model recently, you know, you've launched a fried chicken concept as well. Mm -hmm. I did. I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's called Daybird. Um, simple chicken sandwiches and uh, little sides. Okay, Flynn and Hugh, this question to both of you, this one comes from a lady called Tessa. From a business angle, is it difficult to find support systems and collaborations within the culinary industry due to competition? And if so, how does that impact inclusivity in the industry? Hugh, would you like to, to jump in with that one first? Sorry, repeat the first part of the question. Is it difficult to find support systems and collaborations within the culinary industry due to competition? No, I mean, I think competition is a good thing. I think it pushes us to be better and, and look at details a little more closely. Um, so, you know, collaboration right now is, is happening. It's uh, you're seeing a lot of new ideas come out of the pandemic, which is kind of exciting. Um, but right now we're the biggest issues with our industry is just a lack of employees um, and a lack of workforce. And what about you, Flynn? Do you, do you find issues there with collaborations and competition? How does that happen for yourself in the industry as an emerging chef? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I have, by not really doing anything, definitely made a lot of people who don't like me in the industry. Um, just from a pure, you know, I think there is a, what is this new thing from a lot of older um, kind of chefs. Um, and I think that, you know, America, I, I find is very different than Europe and Asia and these places that are sort of a lot more accepting of younger chefs trying out newer things. I think at first here, there's this sort of initial, like, what are you doing? Um, and, you know, I, I feel that the idea of competition is healthy, but I think competition needs 
a community for it to be healthy competition. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I, especially like a city like New York, like I think of how many restaurants there are here and how many chefs I actually know and talk to. And, you know, it's maybe two or three. And I think that we all talk about how there isn't this community really, but th there's such a large amount of, of competition and no community. So it starts to become this sort of, um, I think kind of the bad so kind of competition opposed to like, you know, we all support each other, but we're also all healthily competitive with each other. And I think that that's definitely, I think a, a, a hard balance to strike, but I I've seen, you know, there's, I think there's cities that I've been in, like, I think Copenhagen's a great example where, you know, there is this real community of all the chefs who know each other, but they all, you know, are doing something kind of similar. So there's inherent competition there. And it's the sort of respect for one another that I oh, healthy competition, healthy competition, we could see a little bit more of. Nice question there from Tessa. And, and Ellie has a question, which I think is good for all three of you, actually. So to all the chefs, you, you've all spoken about the trials of your daily lives. And, and she wonders what comes after that? What do you cook at home? Do you have a favorite dish that you, you keep returning to yourself when you cook at home? May, jumping back to yourself, what's your, your dish that you always return to at home? Um, at home, I really like to kind of cook simple. So I think um, I do a lot of like Danabe cooking. So anything like in a clay pot, um, a lot of rice dishes. Um, something that's really comforting is, is usually what I um, return to. Flynn, what about you, mate? What do you what do you jump to? Uh, the beets. I I never really make beets at home. Um, I usually make you know it's either like something, a pasta with some anchovies and bright kind of citrus and stuff in it, or like a roast chicken with a bunch of vegetables. You know, I I can't tell you a single chef that has ever said that they cook complicated at home. I feel like we all collectively want something very comforting. And what about you, Hugh? What do you go for? Oh, I cook really complex food at home. <laughs> <laughs> You're like sous vide okay. and doing everything for Oh, you. yeah, everything. Everything is aerated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm raising kids that just love aerated food. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, a simple steak with, you know, right now we've got, I mean, we're down south, so we've got things like, you know, beautiful shell beans and, you make simple salads and I eat a lot of salads. So, and my kids like, you know, a roasted chicken with Carolina gold rice and gravy and a bunch of greens. So it, it's pretty, pretty simple. And also for lack of time, I mean, you know, we implore people to cook at home more, but um, still go out and go to restaurants that pays our mortgages. Um, but, you know, for as chefs, I find that uh, oftentimes we don't really want to be cooking for two hours um, when we get home. But and staying on you, Hugh, Alex asks, what do you think the future of the food industry will look like after COVID? What what changes might we see in the near future? Robots. Um we spoke a little bit about this in the chat. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think that I don't think Tuyo food's going away. I think the preponderance of outdoor dining is gonna um is going to be there to stay. I mean, a lot of people firmly believe that this is not the first or last time we're going to see a, a pandemic like this. So I think that people want to be cared for and safe, but uh, in, in a new way. Um, you know, I think you're going to see a reframing of leases. I think the developers are going to have to give in a little bit and they just, there's just not a need for all that restaurant space. And so they're, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's whittling down a little bit. So hopefully we'll see some uh, rent alleviation. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I still think that to go food is going to be very popular. I'm hoping to hell that it's not dominated by Uber Eats and Seamless and all that crap. But, um, you know, I think that you can still support a neighborhood restaurant and uh, you're seeing new ones open up still, which amazes me. Um, but I, I don't think the future is going to be dramatically different, but I think a lot of the safety aspects of what we learned in the last year are going to stick for, around for a long time, think, unless you live in Florida. Stay, staying on that question, May, what, what do you think that, that COVID, what type of changes will this bring for the future of the restaurant industry? Um, I really agree with Hugh. 
um, with the fact that uh, takeout food is going to be um, a thing for a really long time. Um, I, I know a lot of people are still very wary about dining indoors, um, especially with LA just moving up to 50% capacity. Uh, I mean, for me, I actually, when I dine out, I actually prefer to sit outside. So I don't think that I would be personally like comfortable eating in, indoors yet. But um, for sure, takeout food is, is going to be, I think, for a really long time. And, and I like this little cheeky one we've got we've had in here about cooking. What's the easiest dish to cook, but the hardest to get right? Flynn, is it an omelet? Oh, that's hard. Um, the easiest dish to cook the hardest, rice. Rice. The amount, of cooks rice? That, the amount of cooks that I say, can you make rice for family meal and just mess it up so badly. Rice has been the thing I feel like is... It's so easy to everyone that then they mess it up. What about you, man? <laughs> I agree with the rice part. Um, I think that while well, cooking for a large group of people, um, that amount of rice could be a little bit tricky. Um, I, yeah, I, <laughs> that's that's a really hard one for sure. Yeah, and I, I think people have just been inspired by your cooking, so they want to know a little bit more about how you cook at home. We've also got some questions about, do your friends ever offer to cook for you? Um, I know my friends struggle. They always worry about it, like I'm going to judge them or critique them. Do, do your friends cook for you ever, Hugh? Yeah, they do. Yeah. I mean, I, we've been in a pandemic. I don't have many friends. Um, but, you know, sure. And for you, what's the easiest dish to cook, but the hardest to get right? This was a question we had in from Matt. And then before we're going to actually jump out then, unfortunately, that's probably all we have time for, for questions from the audience. But Hugh, finally, what's the easiest dish to cook, but the hardest to get right? I mean, I think scrambled eggs are universally screwed up um, by people. Um, and what's the up? Butter? Mm, butter, lower heat, uh, breaking up of curd. Yeah, it's always one of those, like living in France, tasting it for real, really good scrambled eggs, you realize how, how velvety and creamy it can be. Unfortunately, that's all we really have time for for now, but don't forget that this is the second of two conversations. The first one took place last Thursday, April the 1st, and was moderated by Tarajia Morel and featured Manu Bafara and Diana Davila, two other chefs from biden's today's special book which by the way can be ordered now from the link below your video finally guys and thanks very much for everyone watching at home and thanks for joining us to all the chefs may lynn hugh atchison and flynn mcgarry i just want to ask one final question to you all before we say goodbye for the evening and that is what advice would you offer to the next generation of emerging chefs? Those who are watching, those who want to one day feature on a wonderful book like today's special from Fiden. What advice would you offer? And Flynn, jumping to you, starting. What You go first, mate. Starting with me. Um, I think that uh, there can be a lot of uh, things in the industry that deter people. Um, and I think that I don't want to be the person who's like, oh, you know, ignore all of the rough things because there are a lot of things that deter you for a reason. Um, but I think that really any time that you do a project or have an idea or want to explore something, I think the best thing I've found is to really sit with yourself for a second and think about why you're actually doing it. And if all of those things are going to be worth it for the reason that you want it to happen. Good advice. May, jump into yourself. What advice would you offer? I think you should start by inviting difficult and challenging situations. Um, really, you just have to have passion and, um, you know, just to have an understanding that you didn't have before. Never stop learning different techniques and, and really adding more ingredients to your tool belt. Um, travel a lot. Um, get an understanding of different cultures, um, but really just be true to yourself um, and just never stop pushing the boundaries. And then this is the last question. Hugh, throwing this same question to yourself and, and closing the evening for us. And thanks very much for everyone watching at home and, and, and for all the chefs who joined us for this wonderful conversation. Hugh, what advice would you offer to the next generation of chefs? 
I think uh, they should learn endlessly and be the one person in a kitchen or in a restaurant that everybody is so happy to be working with because you work hard, you respect others, you have empathy, you're constantly learning and, and you're a team player. And that goes for a dishwasher or an executive chef or a maitre d' or a, a busser, it doesn't matter. Um, just uh, be the person everyone wants to work with. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us and, and thanks for all the time that you've given for this conversation and for putting together such a wonderful book. I can't wait to cook some of these recipes for myself at home. Thank you.